Prospect House Media. And now, prepare yourself for the only weekly podcast you won't want to miss. Welcome to the Ameritocracy Show with Troy Edgar, live from our studios in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. Everybody. I am Troy Edgar, and welcome to the Ameritocracy Show. Thank you for tuning in and checking it out. It is greatly appreciated. This podcast examines the conditions for personal and economic growth and opportunity across America. Aloha! This week, I took Ameritocracy on the road to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and met with Hui Oho Ohoana nonprofit CEO and retired Navy CB senior chief, Tony Chance. Tony is a proud veteran who retired after 21 years in the Navy's construction battalion. He put his prior construction experience to good use in his pursuit to revitalize the environment and ecosystems around Pearl Harbor. Hui Oho Ohwanawa, or better known as HOH 808, was officially incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit in December 2020 and adopted a familiar CB's mentality as the core of their mission, which is impossible is where we start. Tony talks about his prior career in the Navy, the history of the CB's veteran transition, and how he started and grew his nonprofit HOH 808. This episode was recorded one week before the unfortunate Maui wildfire tragedy. I send my prayers and condolences to the people of Maui. I also encourage anyone interested in supporting those affected by the disaster to donate to the American Red Cross at redcross.org. Mahalo, and I hope you enjoy. Hey, Tony, how are you doing today? Hey, good, Troy. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to come on. Oh, no, it's great to have you on the show. And, uh, you know, it's great to be here in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having flashbacks. I, uh, you know, I was, we were, I was driving over here to this uh, studio that we were meeting at, um, going through the backside of Pearl Harbor and uh, IAEA and all the, the stuff here. There's a lot of memories here. So it, uh, I, I just really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to come down here and be on the show. Uh, anytime. Yeah. Um, so, Tony, uh, you know, with the meritocracy, a big part of what we try to take a look at is, um, you know, is, is really uh, profile folks that have done extraordinary things, um, you know, and it's all in the eye of the beholder. But, you know, really with the, the firm belief that, you know, America is one of the greatest places ever. And, uh, uh, you know, for me personally, I just feel blessed. And I've been able to do a lot of things that I do. And what I've found in my journey is that there's just a lot of people out there that have these stories that uh, that need to be shared and that uh, through that I think we we lift people up and um, and uh, show that uh, where a lot of people get cynical that there's just a lot of good stuff going on and we need to kind of look at the glass half full um, what I was hoping to be able to do today is uh, to um, uh, share with the listeners your story a couple different objectives I had I wanted you to talk about uh, your Navy experience in the Seabees uh, and uh, talk about uh, that's a little bit of a shared ground uh, you and I have, uh, what the Navy that is, not the Seabees. Um, and then, uh, you know, something that's very important to me is, uh, you know, when veterans or uh, military folks get out of the military and they get ready to go through transition, um, I think what was most uh, compelling to me was your transition out of the military. And I'd like you, if you wouldn't mind, to, to talk a little bit about that. And then um, a lot of veterans, when they get out, uh, you know, sometimes they have jobs that transfer fairly easy. Some find it harder. Um, I, I do try to help veterans through that process. And uh, so something I see is um, that veteran transition is uh, uh, it's a very personal thing. And it's also a, a very tough one when you, know, you figure you're willing to put your life on the line, get out there, you've done stuff for a country. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I see the folks when they get ready to go into a commercial or they're trying to do stuff, they, they struggle with like trying to equate value for this great experience they have. And I wanted your story to me is very inspiring. And I, I wanted to, to share that with the listeners. And so talk about the, um, the transition 
and then uh and and then you've you know you've taken that uh that positive energy put it into a uh, 501c3 organization, and you guys are doing some really incredible stuff at Pearl Harbor in the restoration of Pearl Harbor. And I was hoping maybe to kind of talk uh, about that. And uh, within that restoration, um, one of the, I guess, characteristics of a, of a successful organization is the ability to enlist people um, to to help out. It's, uh, you know, everybody has great ideas, but they, they really, until you get people buying into the idea, uh, supporting it, finding it as a noble cause, um, getting the community involved, um, you know, that to me is a real task and the stamp that says, hey, um, I'm really doing something that's special. And, and again, I, I just, uh, I can't say enough good stuff about what you're doing here. And I, I want you to share that with the listeners. So what I'd like to do is um, step back a little bit, uh, Tony, maybe, uh, you know, take us through a little bit of your origin story and take us up uh, through uh, your time uh, in the Navy. Yeah, great. Thank you, Troy, so much for that uh, incredible introduction. Uh, absolutely. I, I hail from uh, the great state of Arizona, and my mom and dad were house parents, started out on a boys' ranch there, Arizona Boys' Ranch. They were both social workers, and uh, I grew up uh, I was the youngest of three, but my mom and dad raised uh, 10 kids, foster brothers of mine, from age 8 to 18. And uh, my mom and dad put four or eight, I'm sorry, eight out of the 10 on planes to Vietnam, and only four came back. And so they uh, really never recovered from that as much uh, a lot of families uh are different after those type of experiences from uh, their loved ones not returning from uh, war. And uh, so uh, that was my uh, upbringing. I was raised in a very diverse background where we had love, we unconditional love the whole time. I tried to join the, uh, I actually, I did join the Marine Corps mm -hmm. at age 17. My uh, re recruiter, uh, said, uh, Tony, there's this fantastic program you're going to love. And I'm like, oh, what's that? And he said, Tony, that place is called the infantry. Mm. And I was like, oh, what, what does that do? What do they do? And he said, oh, they do, you know, they're going to do this and that and that. And I'm like, I'm sold, sign me up. So uh, my brother uh, had just, uh, he was in the Coast Guard and died on uh, duty. And uh, my mom had to sign the sole surviving son, and she would not do it. So I didn't get to join the Marines at age 17. Wow. So, again, uh, you know, you, you plan and plan and plan, and then, you know, that's that joke. Uh, you know, what is God's funniest joke is when you, you know, you tell him your plan, you know. So off to college I go, and... Uh, uh, College was a uh, uh, kind of a, uh, I wasn't ready for it at a high school, you know, it, and uh, so I didn't do really well in school. Made it all the way to my senior year before I found out that you needed a uh, an actual GPA to graduate. So uh, I had a, was told that I had to go work for a living, you know, it. And so then I started uh, work, and uh, uh, it was probably I was on my own, went uh, working at a lumber store, 100, 100 hours a week, you know, and I was like, this is so miserable, you know. So what do you do when you're, you don't have money, you're miserable, you're down, you're depressed? So the, the one thing that I did uh, was uh, I got married. So, uh, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> not sure that I would yeah. have went right to that, but yeah, I, a lot of people would, uh, yeah. would, uh, advise me against that, but we did when, uh, my wife and I were still, uh, happily married 33 years, but, uh, uh, we got married after knowing each other for only four months. And, uh, so, uh, needless to say, our first year of marriage wasn't, uh, that, the best we didn't i don't even think we knew each other's last names but <laughs> anyway uh so i said there's got to be a better way there's got to be something better and i was looking through the phone book 
and I see this thing said U.S. Navy. And I'm like, hey, why don't I try that? You know, that's got to be better than what I'm doing now. And uh, so I called them up. Uh, the recruiter said, come on down. And uh, I came down there and he said, uh, hey, Tony, there's this uh, program here called uh, CBs. And uh, would you be interested? And I said, yeah, I have no idea what that is. He says, oh, come on, you've seen John Wayne and the Fighting Seabees, you know? And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, you can be like John Wayne, you know? And I'm like, ah, who wouldn't want to be like John Wayne? So uh, so off to the, uh, the Navy I went, and I was, uh, Navy classified me as a builder, carpenter. Went to uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. And uh, my first duty station was up in Norfolk, and... Uh, uh, being a CB, and that was probably, I was around the most uh, innovative, creative, uh, most dedicated human beings I've ever been around in my life. A close-knit uh, community, and we believed in uh, what we did. And the, the CB motto you know, it's true, you know, that uh, in our A school, that's our follow-on school from uh, boot camp, uh, and CBs actually, uh, uh, right before uh, Pearl Harbor, of all places, where we're at right now, which you can actually, uh, from our studios here, throw a, throw a stone and uh, hit Pearl Harbor, uh, but before the attack on Pearl Harbor, we knew that the Japanese were planning an expansion, so... We had uh, civilian contractors go out and build runways on the islands throughout the Pacific. Well, they were getting attacked and and killed and very well-trained human beings, you know, uh, getting killed uh, doing their jobs. So uh, our, uh, you know, civil, civil engineering uh, admiral, Admiral Ben Morrell, decided to arm these uh, construction workers, give them military training, and uh, hence the birth of the Seabees uh, came from there. So, so that was uh, the birth of the Seabees. Seabees is actually a, uh, uh, a word, S-E-A-B-E-E-S. We're after uh, the actual honeybee because uh, the first uh, artist that was designed to make up our logo of our new, this new unit, uh, they build, they build things, they fight, and they do all these things. So we thought of the uh, the beaver, you know, that builds the dams and stuff. But then he uh, he did this thing. Uh, if a lot of of the young, you know, don't know it, but we didn't have uh, internet back then. So he did some reading at the library. Of he found out that beavers uh, do uh, when uh, threatened, they turn tail and run. So he's like, oh no. I can't, you guys can't be the beavers. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, he was sitting there. This artist was sitting there outside his window were these bees. And he's like, oh, the honeybees. That's right. They, they build their hive and stuff like that. What's that all about? So he found out that the uh, honeybee, uh, when, when they build their hive, they will actually defend it from predators with their life. Because once they sting, they die. And he says, oh, that's perfect. And so that actually started our, our who we are. Uh, we build, we fight, and we, uh, we defend with, with our lives. Uh, our motto is uh, the difficult task we do at once, the impossible takes a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, we, uh, I feel that I was drawn to that, uh, that, you know, even though I didn't know what the CBs were, I knew that the military had something that I needed and it was the camaraderie, the, the being valued, you know, as, uh, who you are as a person, your thoughts, you know, again, I'm, you know, I think all of us had our you know, days where we didn't make the best decisions and our, you know, our senior le leadership would, you know, give us that harsh, uh, mm -hmm. 
harsh, uh, you know, talk, you know, and, uh, uh, but, uh, anyway, uh, that was the place for me. Cause I believed in what we did and, uh, we were, you know, the Naval construction force is, is the best on the planet. You know, uh, we do work with, uh, other branches of the military and they're all equally as gifted and, and, and incredible. So t- uh, talk to me a little bit. So you have actually, yeah, after you establish yourself in this profession, um, 22 years? I did 22 years. Uh, and uh, I retired as a E-8. So all the planets lined up and uh, I had a job lined up. And uh, I, when I, my first job out of the military, I did the worst thing you could do. I mean, for me, other people have done it and succeeded, but for me and being a thick headed CB, uh, and a lot of people who know CBs know that, that we're thick headed, you know, but, uh, I left the military on a Friday and went into the civilian sector on a Monday. Yeah, that was harsh. And I didn't even think about it, you know, uh, because I, I went into the civilian sector still as a senior chief in the Navy and no time to, I, I, you know, almost wear my uniform to, to work, you know? And, uh, so anyway, uh, the civilian world is a very different, different beast. Uh, there are two things that make the military unique. I mean, there's a lot of nuances that you can argue why the military is different, but there are two things that set the military apart from the civilian world. And the first is the UCMJ. Uh, That's where we raise our hand up and swear that we will follow the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Well, 14 of the articles in the UCMJ end in death. Hmm. 14. If you don't, if you don't do this job, like not listening to your boss in a time of war, punishable by death. No other organization on the planet does that. Unique. And people volunteer, that's what sets apart. And we're okay with that. So the second thing that we do, and this is where I I struggled with, is the one thing that we do in the military is what we call intrusive leadership. And intrusive leadership is where We are held uh, to know the people that work for us. We not only know them, we know their family. We know their medical condition. We know personal things about them. We help them through divorces, through the deaths of their children, you know, deaths of family members, sicknesses. We know everything about them, and it's valued to be the person who knows your troops the best, right, or your CBs or your airmen, you know. You, you are looked at as a good person or a good leader, actually. Mm-hmm. But we go out in the milit- uh, civilian world, we try that, and we find ourselves at HR pretty quick. Mm-hmm. You know, like, hey, how's the, you know, what's what's your kid? Like, why do you want to know? You know, is it in your business? Like, whoa, whoa, you know? And so I, I think that was one of the hardest things because, you know, I'm an open book. And I was an open book for 22 years. I mean, my coworkers knew everything about me and I knew most of everything about them, right? I get it. There's those onesie twosie stories out there, but I'm talking about the 99.9% of the people. So I think that, uh, uh, yeah, it didn't take me long before I got fired from that job. So in the middle of the, the Navy or the m- middle of your veterans transition, um, you're thinking you had it wired, thinking you had yeah. a job. Um, yep. And, you know, in kind of the first obstacle that I, I see happening a lot with veterans, uh, you have uh, first one that you got over, actually, that I see a lot is, is getting that first job. Um, then you get the first job and you realize even if it's associated um, through a path in the military uh, or a path into contracting work to, to be doing something similar to what you were doing before, but be a civilian, um, still big adjustment there. And, um, talk a little bit about, so you, uh, as you make your transition, um, maybe what you thought was going to be your way to sustain, 
Um, you know, you also started thinking a little bit more about school and trying to use, I know a lot of the veterans talk about the veterans uh, benefits that they get sure. when they come out. Um, let's talk a little bit more detail about the transition. Yeah, absolutely. So after uh, uh, getting released uh, by that job, uh, I was probably kind of at a low point, like most people are wondering how they're going to raise a family and house and car bills and car notes. And so anyway, a really good friend of ours, I, I turned to her and I said, what am I going to do? I am, I'm in full panic mode right now. Mm -hmm. And she looked right at me and said, Tony, you need to be a social worker like my parents, but who wants to do what their parents did, right? You need to be a social worker and you need to let the VA pay for it. And I went, that is a great idea. Were you, in, you were in Hawaii at that point. I was in Hawaii wondering how am I going to pay? Did you, you, did you get out of the service in here in Hawaii? I did. This was my last duty station. I was the senior enlisted for the CBs here on the Island. Oh, okay. Got it. So the, uh, the, the, the landmark decision, you decided to go back to school, uh, University of Hawaii. Um, were you able to do it? Because obviously you had to do work to be able to provide for your family and go to school. Were, were, did, were you able to take the full advantage and be able to, to just go directly into school and full on? Yeah. Uh, so my family was very supportive of the idea. And uh, it, it was a huge leap of faith. It really was. And it was one of the scariest decisions. Uh, not just that, okay, the VA is going to pay for it and you got some money and it's a huge pay cut and we're going to have to cut back some things. And, you know, I might have to get a second job here and there, which I did. Uh, and, but uh, one of the scariest things is the, the military has this read and write at the fifth grade reading level. There's a reason why they put stick figures on our tents when we put them up on a field exercise. So I was terrified going back to school. I went to an actual community college here, Leeward Community College first, not too far from here. Mm -hmm. And my first class was Hawaiian history and English. And those two classes changed my life forever because the professors were amazing. And they found out, and the thing, I think what I found out, and I did it backwards than most, a, a lot of people, right? I had to go out and find my context first. I had to go out and live life first, make the mistakes. Then when I went back to school, everything made sense. So with the first time that I went to school, nothing made sense. And I, you know, didn't do so well. And I got kicked out of college in my senior year. And But for me, being in the military, I learned the context of life. And so when I went back to college, things made sense. And still, I didn't want to be that annoying student where I knew everything because mm. I could be everybody's dad in class, you know, it's so... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how long did it take you to get through school? Yeah. So I, I, I went straight through. I used the uh, voc rehab, vocational rehab through the VA. Uh, I kept the, my GI bill and I actually gave those that to my daughters and helped them get there. They both got their degrees as well. And uh, but I used the voc rehab and working and uh which a lot of people tell you don't don't depend on the school vocation to pay your bills, but you know you you got to do what you got to do, and I did, and I I went straight in 2013 all the way to 2016, got my bachelor's, and then went to got got my master's 2016 to 2018, and then I got my license for social work. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, no, and, and I, I, it, it's interesting as, you know, people, when they get out of the service, uh, the, the program I'm involved with at USC um, in Southern California is a master's of business for veterans. And, um, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because these students are the sharpest, like you said, they, they, they know life. They, they have their frame of reference, their context. Um, it all makes sense. They put it in your terms. Um, so you're able to make that transition. You get into social work. 
um, it seems to be more of a calling though for you. Um, t talk a little bit about this because I, this is where I've been following your story, but as you know, you're able to take that builder um, mindset of the CBs and, um, you know, and, and put it into something that uh, was very meaningful for you. Yeah. So uh, I, I wasn't done serving, you know, and obviously with the social work, uh, but uh, where our house is located uh, along the shoreline of uh, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is actually, if you're not familiar with the uh, the way it's uh, uh, the land geography, it's it's pretty laid out, and there's a lot of cities that are around Pearl Harbor itself. It's just not where the Arizona USS Arizona was bombed. Uh, so anyway, I'd walk my uh, dogs, you know every day along the shoreline of Pearl Harbor. It's a little uh, bike path. And it's just overgrown with mangroves, with other types of trees, invasive species. And within there would be a lot of trash. And there's some areas that were, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, like, uh, it, it's just they would throw everything, I, you know, like, like almost sewage-type water flowing into Pearl Harbor. You know, and I was thinking, this this place needs to be revered. Mm -hmm. And when I took my Hawaiian studies class and found out that Pearl Harbor, the Hawaiian name is Pu'uloa, that this place provided food for almost up to 800,000 people. You know, and that's in the Hawaiian history books, and you won't find that in an American history book, but, you know, Hawaiian, uh, uh, the Hawaiians would actually, you know, sustainable living and uh, Pearl Harbor was, had 12 fresh water streams flowing into it, uh, 34, at least 34 fish ponds. And all these were unique, not the streams, but the fish ponds were unique to the Hawaiian uh, people because they figured out that instead of going out into the ocean to catch the fish, they could actually aquaculture. And that was actually, uh, you know, Hawaiian uh, came out of uh, their uh, sustainability culture, you know, to do that. So when I, uh, when I would see, when I saw that, I'm like, and I found that out, being the CB, I was like, my job's not done. My job is not done. And this is, you know, what I'd like to say to everybody who joined the military for the commitment, you know, where you believed your core values for whatever your services are, you know, the Navy, honor, courage, and commitment. I bought into those. I believe them, and I still do to this day. And, you know, I am committed to getting homeless veterans off the streets. Uh, I'm committed to giving people that are unable to uh, feed themselves. I'm a, you know, you know, this isn't going to be a, a Hawaiian history lesson, but, you know, there's a, a, you know, a huge backstory, you know, on, you know, why we're doing what we're doing to restore Hawaiian fish ponds and bringing back the food to uh, Pearl Harbor, but also restoring the big thing went, and you see this around the country too. This is one of the things that I, I, I hold near and dear to my heart. Hope. We build hope. Hope for the future. We see so much negative things, you know, going on. But we as military know that we have hope. We believe in each other. We have each other's sex. We, we are committed to our mission. We're committed to each other. Or, you know, it, you know, the Hollywood almost doesn't do us any favor because we don't, when we're, when you're down range, I've been in, you know, combat zones four times. You don't sit around and talk politics. You don't sit around and talk, should we be here or not? You don't talk about those things. You talk about the commitment to the mission, commitment to each other. And that's a lot of the things I miss, but you know what? You can do something about it. And you can take back. And what I learned is that being a community leader is uh, commitment. 
You know, you don't sit around and wait for right. government mm -hmm. or handouts. You don't sit around and wait for, you know, oh, who's going to clean this up? Who's going to clean that up? We didn't do that in the military. Right. We did it ourselves. Yeah. Now, that's a, a big uh, a big charge of this podcast is uh, it's really to, to, to show that what is possible and to not have excuses for the things that could be done. Because like you said, I mean, it's not just limited to, to people that served in the military, but I think there's just a significant amount of folks out there that really want to just make the best of what we've got and uh, to accept everybody and everything where we're at and keep going. And, um, and I think, uh, I think you've nailed it, you know, the commitment to the mission and whether the mission is, uh, you know, taking care of your family, uh, whether it's taking care of yourself, uh, whether it's taking care of your community. Um, and I think, uh, you know, when, when you started kind of applying yourself to that in the context of seeing something physically in Pearl Harbor, um, talk a little bit about when you ended up forming your organization and really what you'd hope to achieve. Why, why form an organization at this point? Yeah. You know, why is that? Uh, but again, uh, you know, you look at uh, the true leaders of the past, you know, they did it later in life. And I think it's that we know that if you, you know, having that past and that history and experience, we know what can happen when you in action. We know what happens when you don't do anything. So I think, you know, at uh, starting my organization at age 50, and I'm 58 now, uh, I think that uh, having the context and knowing that you can build the hope, and I'm out there. They see me picking up. When I first, you know, because I'm not Hawaiian, and I started a Hawaiian nonprofit. So the first thing they teach you in Hawaii is to listen and listen. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. You know, you give respect, you get respect. So I brought one of our, uh, our uh, the Hawaiian word for Hawaiian elders is kupuna. So I brought one of our kapuna, Uncle Shad Kane, and I said, Uncle Shad, am I crazy for starting a, non a Hawaiian nonprofit? And, uh, and not being Hawaiian. And he said, Tony, listen, Hawaiians are used to people f saying things and not following through with things, right? So the one thing that is going to make you successful is just show up. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, powerful advice. And that's, that's so true here. I mean, and then, you know, uh, the amount of, it's interesting, you end up you know, bringing in an elder to kind of give you that perspective. I find uh, my experience with Hawaiian people, um, you know, it, it really deep. Um, you know, the, the relationships, uh, it seems like the, the people form here um, lifelong. And uh, and then, you know, to be able to kind of give you that sort of a wise advice that uh, had to be pretty powerful to you. And it almost gave you your charge. It's like, uh, don't be a flash in the pan. Exactly. Yeah. And the thing you said it earlier is a calling, you know, calling to the military, calling to going to school, calling to be a social worker, calling to start a nonprofit. And I was asked, what was that calling? Right. Ho uh, Hawaiians have a word for it's the only word in any country that welcomes you with the word God's love. And that's aloha. Aloha does not mean hello or goodbye. It means unconditional love. And that's what drew me here. That's the calling. That's the calling of the love that I had for, you know, my fellow Seabees, mm -hmm. my love that I had for the community, the love that I had for my country to protect, to put my life, I would stand in front of a bullet. I know thousands of people just like me that would stand in front of a bullet for somebody that didn't even know their name. Mm -hmm. And they would do it. If they were, were able to come back in life, they do it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as you started that organization, um, you know, and again, being a 501c3, it's a charter community organization. Um, you know, you, you have a background, obviously building um, you, you know, the project that, that got my attention was the restoration of Pearl Harbor. Um, 
talk about the stats. I'm a numbers guy. I am a quant uh, freak. Uh, so it, it helps me to, you know, I, I whenever I get involved, uh, I'm involved with a couple uh, nonprofits, and you know, for me, the stats mean everything. It sure. uh, it uh, shows that the people that are actually volunteering or making a difference, people that might be writing checks to help us do things, it shows that. So, you know, talk a little bit about some of the uh, the measures of success that you've had. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a great uh, segue because uh, you know it's simple math, right? Uh, before uh, Captain Cook came here in 1778 uh there were no diseases uh there is was it recorded between 800,000 and a million native hawaiians all sustainable and could feed themselves captain cook comes diseases come and it wipes out almost to uh extinction level within 90 years all the way down to 30,000 but over the years as it is right now if you were to take the census today our last census was we have 1.4 million people. So it's roughly about the same. So here's the math. They were sustainable with about the roughly the same size. We are not sustainable because we cannot feed ourselves. If the ships stop coming and the planes stop coming, I joke. I said, I, I am 100% service connected because I'm broke from the neck down. My wife argues that I'm broke from the neck up, (laughs) but uh, I can't run that fast. So I know I'm going to be one of the ones first eaten. (laughs) So we need to uh, get uh, these fish ponds. We need to get, we have 12 freshwater streams that are toxic. We have 34 fish ponds that you can't eat fish out anymore. We have uh, volunteer. So when I started my organization, it started with two people just working, but we showed up Two turned into four, four turned into, you know, 15 and, you know, you know, the rest. So we have on our monthly work days, we have anywhere between, you know, our last one had 90 people, almost three quarters of them were school kids. And this is during summer when they could be playing video games. They chose to be out there in the hot sun restoring fish ponds because they they know that it's important for their generation right yeah no it uh like i said it uh when people get the misconception like you you properly laid out pearl harbor's much bigger than uss arizona and uh you know when i was stationed out here um, you know, it could take you a half hour to drive all the way around the outskirts of uh, Pearl Harbor, even longer, uh, depending on where you're going. And you do notice, um, you know, I'm from Los Angeles, you know, L.A. River. We, you know, there's a couple different tributaries that kind of go through um, that are just concrete waterways now. But they're actually, you know, rivers and, um, you know, things that sustain life. And so you look at that and you think, oh, you know, there's just a significant amount of area of opportunity. Um, Tony, as you, uh, you look at your organization, um, you know, kind of looking ahead to kind of what's next. And as we get ready to kind of close, what, what would be um, some of the things that you would like to leave the listeners with, with just trying to, if they, you know, we're trying to figure out to take on a cause like this and to take it to the next level. Um, one of the things I thought you might want to mention is, is, you know, being able to get the community involved. You know, I, I love your story of being a non-Hawaiian guy and uh, saying, hey, look, I'm going to do this. And the motto is just show up. Um, so, and that's something that's kind of ingrained into your military training too. But anything else you'd want to leave with, um, with the listeners as a, kind of a closing to this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the thing that we, uh, we use is uh, impossible is where we start. That's from the C. I stole that from the CB. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, never believe that anything isn't possible. Uh, only you don't wait around for the government to do it. You're going to be the one to do it, and people will see you working, and people will follow you. And uh, persistence wins the day. It does, and. Uh, if you want to start your own nonprofit, uh, absolutely go ahead, but you have to have the passion, you know, and you never get up, you know, or start a business or go, 
you have to be committed and the passion. If you don't have it, then go work for another nonprofit that's already working in a similar thing. So, uh, yeah, never give up and never take no for an answer, you know, it, uh, when it comes to business and, you know, uh, but, uh, it's, it's one of the most fulfilling and one of the most frustrating things, but at the end of the day, it's a calling. And we, when you have a calling, it is, uh, yeah, it's pretty powerful. It's emotional. So, yeah. Well, Tony, I, I, again, really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you today and, uh, get together. And, um, I, you know, I just, I wish you the very best. I wish your organization the very best. Thank you. And, uh, I am looking forward I'm, for my listeners. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put some links out on the, um, show notes to, uh, let's inform people of the work that you're doing here in Pearl Harbor and, uh, talk a little bit about your organization. Great. And that's Hui O Ho Honua, or we shortened it. So, uh, because, uh, the, the middle part kind of gets people. So we shorten it to HOH 808. And we also have our, one of our trade names is Malama Pu'uloa, which means to take care of Pearl Harbor. And, uh, so that's our organization. And if you please, uh, nonprofits, we do depend on money and we love money. And we thank you very much for giving us money. And, uh, because without the money, uh, you know, it, uh, hard work and dreams can only go so far. So yeah, thank you so much. No, not a problem. Well, you, you take care of Tony and uh, thanks for everything you do. Thank you, Troy. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks again for joining me today on the Ameritocracy Show. Be sure to follow me on social media and our website at troyedgar.com, where you can get more information and sign up for my weekly email. I hope you have a great week.